I'm excited for the chance to come and spend some time with you guys. I've been looking forward to it for a while. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak. It's something that I think maybe we take for granted and we, well, we have to get a lesson ready. We don't understand. You've been given the opportunity to share and the opportunity to speak. What a wonderful gift that is. I'm grateful for that. I'd like to share with you where we're... Oh, it's on. Okay. Where we are, we talked a little bit this morning about your spiritual wardrobe. You care about your physical wardrobe, every one of you, because you put your wardrobe on when you came. And do you care about your spiritual wardrobe, things that you put on as a Christian? Then we went into why we need some armor. Well, Satan's out there using crafty devices, wolves and tares and thorns and traps and snares and nets and things that are designed to bring a Christian down. And so God gave us more than just clothing. He gave us armor to deal with these problems. Then we saw the belt of truth. Do you 100% tell the truth at all times, even when you don't want to tell the truth? Who stole the cookies? Mmm. <laughs> Let me clean the crumbs off my beard, man. Not me. And there's a chocolate streak, you know, you didn't get the chocolate streak. Did you or did you not steal the cookies? It's very, very important that you do tell the truth all the time. No matter what, if it hurts or if it doesn't hurt, and you'll find that as you live your life, and even if you go to work and you tell your boss, I'm behind schedule. Well, if you're always <coughs> telling the truth, and you tell him the truth that you're behind schedule, he's going to ask you, can you get on schedule? Yes, sir, I can. Good. He knows you can tell the truth about the bad parts of the schedule. He will listen to you about your plans for the good parts of the schedule. Because you tell him the truth. And your teachers, they're going to ask you. And you think, well, yeah, I did my best on this paper. Did you? Because it looks like a sloppy mess. And your teacher knows it looks like a sloppy mess, and you spent four minutes writing the thing. Tell her the truth. Every time. It will never fail you to tell the truth. But we move on into the breastplate of righteousness. This is the second item in the list in Ephesians. And there's a clue, this verse right here. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This will help you understand where we're going to go with this lesson. It's his righteousness that we're seeking. What is that? I don't understand it. I thought righteousness is when I did real good for my teacher. And she said, good job, little boy. Is that it? What is righteousness? How are we going to figure this thing out? So, the breastplate is the second piece of armor listed. After the belt of truth, which is the foundation, then you put this on. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Not much to go there. Whose righteousness is it? What is it for? What is it used for? How does it work? Not much to go on, so we have to dig. It is your true protection, but you have to know what it is. Or you might be putting on the wrong thing. Of course, I want to grab the sword first. You kids would love to have a sword, right? Where's the sword, man? You didn't even bring your sword. That's coming next time. It's not coming this time. What's a breastplate? The breastplate is the front armor that covers your torso. It covers all your vital organs. You know what I have in here? Besides Dion pizza? I have salad, right? But I also have a heart, and I have some guts and stuff that are digesting my food, and I have some kidneys. I don't want any of those parts to fail. Because if one of my parts in here fails, then I would die. And I would fall over on the ground, and they would have to dig a hole. Because Evan's gone. This is what we cover when we have a breastplate. We cover all that gutsy stuff that's not going to get hurt. And you can shoot your arrows at me, and it's going to hit something. Not my tummy. This is real squishy stuff. It's a little bit harder up here, right? But not down here. This is just, it would be terrible to get hit there. You have to have a breastplate. It protects my vital organs with mobility. I still can move. I can still get around. This item actually does help me move freely. And we'll see that as we go along. You gain an ability to approach God with this breastplate that you don't have otherwise. If you don't have this breastplate, you cannot approach God properly. You gain freedom from the chains of your sinful nature if you have this breastplate on. Here's a native's breastplate. The natives wore them, and they 
not real strong, not real structural, but very, very neat to look at. Egyptians, ooh, the Egyptian had the coolest breastplate. Didn't cover his squishy stuff. I don't know why. <laughs> that, it looks really great, but he's vulnerable down here. There's all kinds of squishies, and he's gonna get hit. I don't know. If, maybe he was just so intimidating. Nobody's gonna mess with you if you're wearing that. A horse? Come on! That's a breastplate. It looks like a string, and yet they call that the horse's breastplate. It just does not look very secure to me. This dude knows what a breastplate is. The cops wear them all day. You know what? When you're an officer of the law, you put this thing on every day. Well, why aren't you as a Christian putting on your breastplate every day? You're a warrior for God. The cop can do it. Why can't we? Got to put our breastplates on. This is a breast piece. Don't get confused between a breastplate and the breast piece. If you start reading the Old Testament, you're going to read about this one. This is something that was not designed to protect the squishies. This was designed to communicate with God and to represent the tribes of Israel. It means the shiny thing. The word literally means the shiny thing. He's got a shiny thing on his chest. Totally different. Not related. This is a Roman musculata. This is the Roman breastplate that they had. They had many different kinds. They had a segmentata, which is the most common. Segmented meaning it had pieces all connected together and pieces, <laughs> a whole bunch of pieces riveted together. The musculata was a single piece of solid metal. And there was no chance that you were going to get stabbed anywhere when you were wearing this thing. The Hebrew word is shirion. The breastplate is a covering or a chest armor or a coat of armor that you wore on your chest. The Greek word, you guys ready to learn a Greek word? Joy, I get to learn a Greek word. Thorax. Have you ever heard of a thorax? Yes. A little ant has pieces, right? It has a, a little piece on the back and a little piece on the front. I don't know what those are called. The middle one's called a thorax. And the thorax is the breastplate for the poor little ant. He would be very sad if he didn't have his breastplate on. This is the Greek word thorax. So if you're running along in scripture and you run over the word breastplate, it's thorax. That's what it is, a middle protector. The function is the heaviest part of my armor. I did not bring my breastplate. It's on its way here right now from India because I had to have brass. I could have had many other materials. I had to have brass. I just fell in love with brass all of a sudden. So it's on its way. Maybe I'll bring it next time and you can look at an actual, feel how heavy the thing is. Uh, can you stand up and carry a piece of breastplate? It's very heavy. It blocks the vital attacks, but it displays your alignment. Okay, this is something that we don't understand. We don't have these battles anymore. We don't see warriors walking down the street with this kind of clothing on anymore, with their armor. What alignment means is, I am on God's side. I'm on God's side. So when I wear a breastplate, it needs to be God's breastplate of righteousness. Not mine. It's not my alignment that counts. It's my alignment with God that counts. Amen. It displays your alignment. Which side are you on? So when these two battles are coming together, there's two different breastplates out there on the field and things are flying and slashing and I don't know where to stab, but I'm not going to stab anybody that's displaying God's armor because it's aligned with him. It causes you like a knight of old to be able to approach your king. If you're not wearing this stuff, you have no business approaching the king. You're a peasant and get out of my court. You don't belong. So what are you wearing? Well, let's find out. I'm going to take Evan. I'm going to take Evan's condition and say, okay, sir, what are you wearing as a breastplate? 1 Peter 4 and verse 18. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? It's hard for a righteous man to be saved. Wow, that's interesting. Well, I'm working very hard to try to be righteous. What's with my breastplate? Ezekiel 18, verse 24. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin. Okay, I've done that. I was a righteous man and I committed some sin. You know what? I stole a pencil from work. I knew it was theirs. I stole a pencil. And it's in my car. And so I have stolen a pencil. Have I committed an unrighteous act? Sure have. I can't say, well, they have lots of pencils. 
And so I can just take one. Does that make it okay? No, it's still stealing. I know it's stealing. I know it's stealing in my mind to take the pencil that belongs to the guy at work. I have stolen. A righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits sin and does the same detestable things that the wicked man does. Will he live? None, I need you to pay attention to this phrase, none of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. Whoa! I was living a righteous life and I was doing so good and I decided to steal a pencil. None of my righteous deeds will be remembered anymore. What's up with that? It doesn't seem fair. Because of the unfaithfulness he is guilty of, and because of the sins he has committed, he will die. Ever stumble at one point of the law? Have you? Have you stumbled? At any point in the law have you stumbled? Because guess what? You broke it. If you stumble at one point in the law, no matter how trivial, you broke the law. It's broken. Your righteousness means nothing now. I just no longer have anything on my chest. I have no righteousness. What am I going to do? Romans 3.23 says this, For all have sinned. This is how I know you broke the law. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means me, Evan. You have sinned, you have fallen short, and if you brag about not sinning, you just sinned and fallen short of the broken, it's gone. If you say you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is obviously not in you. You are not wearing a belt. Right? You're not wearing a belt if you say you have righteousness that is good enough for God. You're not even wearing your belt. So you're definitely not wearing your breastplate either. Without God's righteousness, the hard truth is that you're a condemned criminal. You have no armor and you have no excuse. You have no alignment with God. That's your condition. What are we going to do? I know what I'll do. I'll do some righteous deeds. I can do some more righteous deeds, right? Well, I just prove to you that you broke the law, and you're convicted by the laws of lawbreaker, and you deserve death. Isaiah 64, verses 5 through 6, when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us be, have become like one who's unclean, and all our righteous acts are filthy rags. This is what you want to try, you can try. So I brought you a filthy rag. All right, anybody want to wear this? It's lovely, right? Looks great. Hmm, it's kind of threadbare. Look, I can poke a hole right through it with my finger. That's a terrible rag. So do you want to put this on and defend yourself against the sword? <laughs> with something I can poke through with my finger? I don't think so. It's just, well, it's not very pretty either. Plus it might get stuff on me. Ew. This is what we present to God when we say we're going to do righteous deeds. We're going to make it so that God accepts us because we're doing our righteous deeds. You know, when you work, you get dirty. When you're doing deeds, you're getting dirty. And a rag is good for dirty things. So pretty much I have no breastplate. I could try the dirty rag approach. Here's me. I'm still naked. I'm not wearing the truth and I'm not wearing my breastplate. Most Christians are naked. They try to live a godly life and think, if I just do enough good deeds and, and I be as righteous as I can be, then I'll be doing great and God will accept me. But that's not how it works, is it? Here's a naked baby. Do they put on a new man? Do they put on Christ? That's the question. How terrible it would be if we bring people to our way of religion and we say, do as many good deeds as I'm doing, because we can all get to heaven together without pointing them to the cross. Without pointing them to God's righteous breastplate. Here's 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ is in you? Jesus Christ is in you. Unless, of course, you fail the test. The real test of whether or not I'm wearing a breastplate is not my deeds. It's whether or not Jesus Christ is in me. If I have taken up my cross, like we saw before, and Christ is in me, I have my breastplate on. I have righteousness. Unless I fail that test. And I can tell you that it's okay to test yourself this way. I put Evan on a chopping block and I say, Evan, 
Are you or are you not wearing a breastplate? Because that's what Scripture says. Examine yourself to see whether you meet the qualifications or not. Are you or are you not wearing Christ as your breastplate? Have you ever worn sackcloth or dumped ashes on your head? That's where I'm going to go next. I've got some sackcloth and I've got some ashes. I've been waiting for a good opportunity. I've passed up a few opportunities to do it. Because it's itchy. I put it on my skin and I'm like, oh, I don't want to wear that. Oh, it, oh, it itches so bad, sackcloth. But the Israelites did it. What did it accomplish for them? Have you considered? What did it accomplish to wear sackcloth and pour ashes on your head? It kind of puts you in your place. It kind of says, you little man are a filthy rag. And you're wearing rags as clothing and dumping ashes on your head because you care about something or someone else. How about this? Do you fear condemnation? Do you fear hell? Hell's going to get me. God's watching. He's going to get me. He knows what I'm doing. Do you fear that? Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who walk according to the Spirit. If you're not solid with this verse, you're not wearing your breastplate. If you think that there's some chance that you're going to fry in the fires of hell, might, probably, could, maybe, depends on the time. You know, if it's like after I stole the pencil from work, ooh, I'm in trouble. But if you think this way, you're not wearing your breastplate. How about lifting up holy hands? This has been a struggle for me. I can't lift up my holy hands because I know I'm filthy rags. And I know my righteous deeds aren't good enough. Is this you? Are you wearing your breastplate or not? These thoughts prove, beyond any doubt, Evan, you are not wearing God's breastplate. You're just not. You're trying to make one. Something else. Your only hope is this. God cannot possibly have anything to do with you if you have sin. He can't. It's just like if I turn on the light in a dark room, the darkness cannot resist the light. The light will flood through and destroy any darkness that was there. And so I can't in any way or shape think, well, God can deal with my sick, black, filthy heart somehow and be okay. He can't. When he turns on his light, you will be blown away. And it's not because he wants to blow you away. It's because he's light, and in him there is no darkness. Yet I am swimming in filthy darkness. I'm walking in a fallen and condemned world, and I have sinned. This becomes a serious issue. This becomes an issue I need to know about. What am I going to do? I've tried my filthy rags. I got my filthy good deeds, and I said, I'm going to do the best I can, God, and it looks great. And I'm going to approach a king that way? I don't think so. The king and his whole court is going to say, Ew, get out. You do not belong in here. Then the king does this. The king takes off his breastplate. And he says, I've got one. I've got a breastplate that I'm willing to take and put on these people. And that's the breastplate of righteousness. It's God's breastplate, not ours. And he paid one Jesus. He paid one Jesus for this thing. So I brought a breastplate. It's not going to be much good. That could protect me, right? If I had this on and it was made out of metal, and somebody could take a sword, and they can going know squishy parts that are going to get hit. Right? This does nothing, and I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> to compare with what God builds in his righteousness, this is nothing. It's a piece of plastic. It's a joke. But it kind of gets the point across. It is his righteousness that I put on. It is aligned with him. And when I approach the king wearing this, he looks at it and he instantly recognizes whose alignment am I with? I'm with him. I'm on his team. It's not because of my deeds. My deeds are filthy rags. It's because of Jesus that I look like this. The breastplate. Here's what it's like if you try to do this with human effort. Matthew 5 and verse 20. I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, wait a minute. I know what the Pharisees were like. They were perfect. 
They were flawless. They walked around like living statues. And they did everything exactly right. When they got up in the morning, they put their clothing on exactly the right way, and they brushed their teeth with exactly the right materials, and they didn't have two mixed kinds of materials because they couldn't do that because everything was perfect. That kind of righteousness I need to be way better than, or I'm not going to approach God. This verse, if you do not understand the breastplate of righteousness, this verse makes no sense. But if you consider it like this, his righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. God's righteousness can blow the Pharisees away. That's a big difference. The Pharisees had perfect righteousness, and we need a lot more. We need God's righteousness. Here's another example of this in Hosea 6 and 7. Hosea 4, 6 through 7. My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also rejected you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. Anybody is scared by these words? It's kind of like a famine of the word. How scary is that? How about God ignoring you? What? I don't hear nothing. Are you praying? I'm ignoring you. That happened in the Old Testament. That happened in Malachi. You weep and you cry and you moan and, you, and, and you're not listening. Why? Because you're violent and because you're throwing away your families and your marriages <coughs> with violence. I'm ignoring you. God will do this. The more the priests increased, the more they sinned against me and they exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. Did you catch the pattern that just happened? The more the priests increased, the more they sinned against me, they exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. All I can come up with is they gave away God's glory and they thought because they had more and more priests, more and more laws covered, more and more righteous deeds going, they covered themselves with filthy rags. That's what they did. They said, this is going to be good enough, God. If we just do enough good deeds and we just do them right, I know it'll work. They exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. More for human effort. Galatians 2, 21. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. If righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died in vain. Same thing here. I do not set aside the grace of God. I have my right. I could take this thing off and set it aside, but I don't do that. Because if righteousness could be attained doing anything like that, then Christ wasted his time coming here. Are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Really? Do you want to try that? <laughs> you really want to try to make this good enough to approach God? I don't think so. These were the believers now. Believers were given this instruction in Galatians. Romans 10, 3 and 4. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. This is exactly what I've been explaining to you. Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. This verse should make you jump up and say, Praise God! Righteousness for everyone who believes. You mean a sinner? Yes. I stole a pen? Sure. Because it's not your stealing the pen that you're getting fixed. It's the righteous alignment with God that's getting repaired. And Jesus did that. None of my work is going to help with that. We seek to establish our own, don't we? You will not sneak into the king's court with a false breastplate. You will not. You just, you're going to be caught. You're the one sneaking in there, and here's the king, and he's like, who's that? I don't remember him. Who is he? Bring him forward. Well, I'm really righteous guy. No, you're not. You're approaching the king with your own cheesy, filthy rags. Throw him in the dungeon. That's what would happen in the king's court. Satan loves denominations. Because they make us think we're right. Satan loves denominations because they make us think we are right. 
We're not right. God is right. We're not good. God is good. Do we have the truth exactly here and not over there at that other one? The church down the street? We think we're right. We think we have a great breastplate and God's going to use it and like it. Very dangerous. Our king saved us. Titus 3, 5 through 6. He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit who he poured out on us generously through Christ our Savior. Not because of the righteous things we had done, but because he was merciful. When I approach the throne in my filthy rags and Jesus and God see me, they say, that one, ugh, give him this. Give him righteousness. Pour it out on him generously. It's generous. You know, these things are expensive. <laughs> expensive! This is the most expensive piece of armor out there. That's why I don't have one. I have all the other ones, but I'm waiting on this one. When I started making these lessons, this is what I could afford. <laughs> Praise God for his generosity and giving us a standing and alignment in heaven. All right. There's a new righteousness. I've kind of shown how that we're in trouble with our sick and our sinful nature and our blackness. And we try to establish our own and it doesn't work. There's a new righteousness. Romans 3, 21 and 22. <clears throat> but now, a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Praise God. There's a new righteousness. Get rid of your filthy rags. Here, you want filthy rag? <laughs> I don't need it anymore. I'd much rather have God's righteousness than that. It's not going to get you dirty, by the way. It's paint. It's not, it's not oil. It's paint. The righteousness from God has been poured out on us by faith in Christ Jesus. To whom? To whom? The good people? The ones who do a really good job. The ones that look holy. To all. Isn't that word in there? All. To all who believe. I don't have to wonder whether or not you deserve God's righteousness. You do. He gave it to you. It was mercy. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But he gave it to all who believe. Jesus is our righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Where does your righteousness come from? It's Jesus. That's what it is. It's not my deeds and my filthy rags. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to become sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him who had no sin become sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You need to study this one and memorize it. God made him who had no sin become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is the breastplate in one tiny little verse. I've shown you many, many, many more. Here's Paul's view. Paul went into detail. Thankful for Paul that he went into so much detail. Because in Ephesians 6, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, what? I don't know how. Now we can get some how. Philippians 3, 4 through 10. If anyone thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now, was he a liar? I don't think so. I think he had faultless righteousness. His rags were filthy rags, but they were good ones in his estimation. This would be how this would work today. I'm a Yarbrough. I'm a Yarbrough of Yarbroughs. I was born, I was taught under William Yarbrough. And Galen Yarbrough brought me up. He was a great father. And as for the church, early to become an elder, 
and uh, taught in Albuquerque a lesson about armor, right? That's what it would be. If this is exactly how he was bragging, this is how I'm bragging. But it's nothing, okay? So he thought, I'm perfect in my perfect righteousness, right? So let's go on and keep reading. We're still in Philippians. Philippians 3, 4 through 10, so we just saw the first part. But, so he told us all that wonderful stuff. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss. And this word means a violent breakage, a toss. This means this toy is no good to me anymore. The arms are broken off and the wheels don't work. I'm throwing it in the trash. That's what I consider all what I just bragged about. I'm throwing it in the trash. Compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Are you ready to lose everything? Are you ready to put away anything else and focus on the breastplate of righteousness? I consider them rubbish. Now this word does not mean rubbish. The word that needs to be here is dung, feces. That's the word, the S word, basically. He used it right there. I consider it all dung. That's what the old King James, I think, used. That I might gain Christ and be found in him. That's a bold statement from a man who was perfect in legalistic righteousness of Pharisee. I consider them rubbish that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. What? Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. Is there any doubt about the righteousness, where it came from, whose it is? It's God's righteousness. This allows me bold, free movement. 2 Corinthians 3, 9 through 12. If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, talking about the law that condemns men, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Now he's comparing the old law with the filthy rags that you may or may not survive, that you probably be killed from, that you have to sacrifice for. He's comparing that one to God's righteousness. How much more glorious is it? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with his surpassing glory. It was good when it was given, but it was filthy rags compared to Christ. It's nothing. It's fading away. And if that what fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? This is why I have to have a brass breastplate. I noticed when I picked this thing up, it's broken. It's cracking. This little crack's going to come down here and ruin all my nice artwork, which is not very nice artwork, by the way. I could do a little bit better. It's broken. It doesn't last. If it can't even last through three lessons, I really need a better one, because I need something that's going to last. And he's saying, that old law is fading away, but something is coming that's going to last with surpassing glory. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Are you very bold, or are you, eh, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not? Well, you're not wearing a breastplate. Put your breastplate on it, it says, I belong to God. You are very bold. And when someone comes at you with a sword, ting, bounces right off. Ting, it's gone, not going to hit you, no squishies getting hurt. The breastplate is why you can approach the throne of God with boldness, because you're wearing his righteousness. You're not wearing your own righteousness. What about these white robes? All right, I went through all that, I'm convinced, but something in the back of my mind is saying, aren't there some kind of white robes that represent the good deeds of the people? Something like that. Here's Revelation 7, 13. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? So I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have made it out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. First of all, I challenge you, is this righteous deeds? Or are they washed in the blood of the Lamb? Interesting thought. 
Now I know my white deeds represent, my white robe represents my deeds. But at the same time, the blood of the lamb is in there. Without the blood of the lamb, my righteous deeds are worthless. They're filthy rags. Revelations 19 and 7 through 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. I want to notice it was given to her. Even my righteous acts were given to become a part of this part of the congregation upon her as part of the bride. For the fine linen is the righteous, what? Ness? Is it righteousness of the saints? Or is it righteous acts? Righteous deeds of the saints. The righteous deeds I do, do not make me right before God. But they do make me clean and white. Righteousness, the state of being, is given to you by God. It's your breastplate, and it was his. And he paid one Jesus for it. Your righteous deeds become your robe in heaven. And it's a white robe, and it's nice. But you would much rather have that breastplate when you're preparing to meet a king. How are you at preparing for this banquet, by the way? How are you at preparing your white robes for this banquet that's coming? Because that needs to fit in here somewhere in the armor lesson. You need a white robe. Here's your righteous credit. We're almost towards the end here. Romans 4, 5 through 8. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. How can there be righteousness apart from works? You know, a lot of people struggle with this back and forth. Show me your deeds, and I'll show you my deeds without my faith. And Some great men battled over this whole problem because they didn't have their breastplate on. In my opinion, they didn't have their breastplate on. They didn't get this. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. All of a sudden, covered makes a little more sense, doesn't it? I'm covering this squishy stuff with righteousness. It's covered. It's covered. It's good. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. What? God will never count your sin against you. Why? Because you're behind his breastplate of righteousness. It will never, ever, ever count. Praise God, I'm done. Romans 5 and 18. Just as the result of one trespass was the condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. One act paid one Jesus, it's done for all men. No amount of me working is going to ever make enough filthy rags to come up with that. Jesus paid it for me. Our righteous deeds please God. You can look through these and find that if we bear fruit, we're pleasing to God. If we offer our bodies a living sacrifice, we're pleasing to God. If we look out for our weaker brother, we're pleasing to God. If we obey our parents, we're pleasing to God. Did you know that? If you obey your parents, you're pleasing God? How cool is that? Teaching the word in truth pleases God. You can list a thousand of these things that say, this is what pleases God. It's just a tiny little bit of them, the righteous deeds. Praying for the authorities pleases God. Supporting your family members pleases God. Doing good, sharing with others, keeping the commandments, all these things please God. But they do not make you righteous. God made you righteous. Here's what it looks like to wear it. The last couple slides. Ephesians 5, 8 through 11. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. This person is wearing a breastplate. Living as a child of light. And here's my fruit, by the way. Righteousness is a fruit, goodness and truth. And finding out what pleases God, that's what I'm going to do. We must strive to do right. I don't want to say that you can't possibly have any righteousness, because that's not true. You do make good deeds as white robes in heaven. 1 John 3, verse 7, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. 
He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Always pointing back to God's righteousness. Always. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God. They obviously don't have their armor on. James 1 and verse 20. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. God does desire me to try to live a righteous life. But it's not what's going to get me to heaven. It's not what paid the price. God wants righteous deeds from you. How are you doing? In conclusion, your righteous state is a gift from God. He saw you approaching as a king, and he said, cover that one with my breastplate. It's not your armor, it's his armor. It's borrowed. It's his armor. Your righteous deeds are pleasing to God and become white robes for heaven. So try to get them a little straighter in your mind. What is righteousness? What are righteous deeds? What is righteous state? To come up with wearing your breastplate. This part of the armor is the most expensive. It was the most expensive for me, so expensive I didn't get here on time. It is the most expensive to God. It cost him his son. Don't forget that. When you sing that song about the fountain free, do not forget it was not free. It cost God his son. That's what kind of breastplate he has for me. No matter what I do, no matter what I make, no matter what I purchase, it's nothing compared to God's righteous breastplate. Wear your breastplate. We'll have a song of invitation.